Welcome back to the Mom Mentality Show. My name is Austin Chadwick and co-host is Chris Lucian. And today we are excited to have Moses Homan and Andy Slocum on the show. And uh, we got some really exciting topics lined up. So we got the uh, some circa 2000, early 2000s mob programming for Moses and Andy back at ThoughtWorks then. And uh, what was their experiences then? What was the genesis of uh, 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 their experiences there? And then comparing that with how uh, momming is done now. Uh, Flare Health and ThoughtWorks. And uh, yeah, and then if we have time, we'll get to some team building and mobbing stuff. So uh, before jumping into those topics, uh, let's uh, have you introduce yourself, starting with you, Moses. Hey, everybody. I'm Moses Homan. Uh, I've been a coder since I was a kid, since I was 10 years old. Uh, I started my professional career uh, with Andy, actually, at ThoughtWorks a couple of decades ago, which is kind of amazing to imagine that. Um, and a uh, wonderful place to get my start learning Agile and all that kind of stuff. And uh, doing that for a while, uh, and mostly working in um, since ThoughtWorks in various healthcare related things. Most recently, I'm CEO and co-founder of a company called Flare Health. We're a healthcare tech startup uh, remote, but uh, I'm based here in Chicago and we help uh, patients get to the right specialist faster. How about you, Andy? Yeah, uh, Andy Slocum. Uh, I'm a principal consultant at ThoughtWorks, uh, which means I'm sort of the tech side of running running big accounts. Uh, I've yeah, I started actually with Moses. That's my first job. Uh, I've just hit 22 years at ThoughtWorks, which is a little mind blowing for me. Uh, but yeah, custom software delivery, uh, helping teams, you know, helping my teams get better, helping the client get better. That's my passion. Right on, right on. Well, thanks for those intros, and let's dive into it. So. Tell us about your experiences in the early 2000s uh, with uh, a mobbing or mob programming. Uh, for, for many of us in the community, that sounds early. So that we're really intrigued to hear uh, what was going on there. So uh, kick it off, please. Yeah. Um, so uh, when I joined ThoughtWorks, I, so my previous, previous to ThoughtWorks, I uh, was a graduate student. I got a PhD in physics. And um, as a graduate student, I observed folks that were entering the professorial ranks and kind of how they negotiated their early careers. And one of the things they did is they organized group events. Uh, this one person that was really great, did, did, uh, had an amazing career, great guy. Um, so I, I kind of followed him and uh, had that thought in my brain. Uh, and I also thought works was a wonderful place to start a professional software development career. They like first year they sent me to Uppsala 2000, which was the big object-oriented programming conference back then, which I'm sure nobody's heard of at this point. <laughs> um, but uh, at that conference, I heard this guy, uh, Richard Gabriel, who was one of the big uh, software patterns people. Uh, I guess he went by Dick Gabriel. He was very like typical of the time, uh, you know, sort of software guru guy with long hair and big beard, you know, just kind of um, uh, definitely in a, a, the kind of like, what I liked about software that the, the, the community, as opposed to a lot of um, the, the, the structure and hierarchy of, and sort of traditional aspects of academia. Um, so I, I love going to his talk. He actually, he gave a talk at Uppsala entitled Mob Software, The Erotic Life of Code. A very provocative title. He was a poet as well. He viewed software writing and, and poetry sort of on, on the same plane. And uh, anyway, his talk was all about how the fact that we don't have enough programmers is going to be solved in the future by the fact that everybody will be kind of contributing to code and uh, the, the, the mob will be shaping the software that we all use. Um, and, you know, sort of, I guess, pre, you know, prescient in terms of the development of GitHub and that kind of stuff. It's not quite to the level that he was talking about, but still uh, pretty, pretty cool talk. He was like dressed in some kind of robe and he had like a, a bell he would ring between the, 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 the sections of his talk. So it made an impact on me. Um, and, uh, at the time, ThoughtWorks, uh, the team that Andy and I were on, uh, uh, you want to speak a little bit about that, Andy? Yeah, yeah, sure. We were we were writing a, a large application. Um, it was sort of a custom workflow, uh, and it had when when Moses and I joined, it had been going for about a year, year and a half. Uh, but we'd already had something like two hundred pages. You know, this was back in the in the you know JSP and EJB era. Um, so it was a lot of code, a lot of, you know, generated stubs and skeletons trying to get your, your data into and out of the database. Uh, and, and what we found coming in was, you know, the team was sort of 
maybe a dozen developers, but they were already segmented very much into, you know, you had you had the, the two devs that only worked on this section, the two devs that only worked on this section. Uh, and we had been hearing about extreme programming and we've been hearing about, you know, collective code ownership and, and test driven design and unit testing. Uh, and so we were really sort of scratching our heads at how we get from very, very sort of siloed code development into a more collective model. And we were even seeing a lot of, um, you know, classes that were, that were copied and reused in different parts of the app, uh, you know, unchanged or slightly changed. Uh, and so we, you know, we, we were trying to figure out how to, how to solve that. So, yeah. yeah. And so, so we, the idea that we sort of started toying around with was, was, well, why don't we do the opposite of everybody working on their own thing <laughs> and actually get together for a lunch and talk about the code that we're writing and maybe get to know it from each other. And that, that practice went through a couple of iterations. It was a little tricky. Like at first it was just talks people would give about some part of the code that they had. And like most people fell asleep, you know? <laughs> um, and so we tried to make it a little more interactive. And so we, we came up with this idea of having uh, people actually refactor the code in the session during the lunch, so eat lunch and then refactor. So, and we, the name that we came up with it sort of inspired by Dick Gabriel's talk was mob programming. As we knew about pair programming, we knew about, you know, drivers, navigators from that and Lori Anderson's wonderful work in that area um, and many others. And, and so we just thought like, what's, what's a bigger, what's bigger than two. It's, it's, it's a mob. So um, that's kind of how, how the genesis started, but it was just focused on refactoring. That's all that we did. And we actually started, uh, refactoring stuff that we would actually use. It sort of, it was an evolution. It's again, it started off just familiarization, but realized that making it more interactive, people were more engaged and it was more meaningful for everybody in the room. Uh, and so that's kind of how it went. Um, and we did it a few times. And at the time, like ThoughtWorks were just getting into the agile space. We had one project that was really sort of like the agile project at ThoughtWorks, which is funny to say at this point in time. Um, and we were not on it, <laughs> but we wanted to be. So, uh, you know, we, we wanted to get involved in the Agile space too. And uh, we so we submitted a paper about this thing that we were doing to XP uh, Universe 2001, which is a, a conference before Agile was, was the big term. Was, uh, XP was more prominent at the time, extreme programming. And um, we presented that paper and it was like, it was cool. Like we got published in Extreme Programming Perspectives, which was this anthology of a bunch of papers that were published in conferences around that time and it was a lot of fun um and and so and then the funny thing is uh after that experience i didn't use mob programming for quite a while <laughs> i will confess we use it at thoughtworks for that lunch and then i i, I andy knows more about what happens after that than i do but um uh, my mobbing story resumes much much later in my life yeah, and maybe um, I can jump in. There. So, uh, you know, I found it really interesting that you were just refactoring um, during during that time. And so, um, you know, I, I, you know, I had when I started mobbing, I'd never heard of the term mob programming or anything like those lines. Um, and uh, in, in our scenario, um, it was, uh, you know, a single developer was having trouble with the delivery and then we all got into a room to work together on the code. Mm -hmm. um, and then it started by, by refactoring and then, and then discovering kind of a, um, uh, a dependency that, that uh, was known to be permanently buggy. And so uh, a large portion of the, of the system had to be rewritten. Um, and so then we, uh, and so I, I think like, maybe a key difference between our experiences, which was really interesting, um, was that uh, I think we were forced to rewrite the entire software together as a mob at that point. Um, <laughs> and so so we just kept going and going and going. Right. Um, so, right. but, I, you know, I, I'm actually, you know, I think back to that first day and um, we retrospected at the end and said, yeah, we should keep doing this. We should keep doing this. We should keep doing this. Um, and by the time we finished that first project, we had done the entire software from beginning to end that way. And we were comparing to what, what happened when the person was solo. Uh, so it's a really interesting um, thing because you, it's probably true that had we not been forced to rewrite that entire software, uh, then maybe we, would, we may have not continued, right? Um, so kind of an interesting thing, yeah. Yeah. It is interesting. 
that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really cool. That is like kind of, I've had some good kind of lunch and learn experiences, uh, previous places too. A lot of good stuff has happened out of that. Uh, from those sessions, was there any observations or comments or reflection from people who participated or was it just kind of like, Oh, that was a interesting lunch moving on, you know, or <laughs> do, you, do you have any memory back then of uh, anything? Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think, I think we, you know, we struggled figuring out how to do it well. Um, we would, so for instance, you know, as Moses said, we would spend time refactoring the code uh, and then, you know, lunch was over and we wouldn't really have gotten it done. Uh, so then we started appointing someone from the meeting to go and sort of complete the refactoring, right? We've got you, we've got you moving in a direction and you're going to go and complete it and sort of come back to us. And then we'll, we'll add that back into the code base, right? So, so getting it to where now we can write enough tests around it, you, know, you can't really do that in an hour. Um, not for not for the the sort of size of the code we were working with, uh, the size of the classes. Um, so that was one thing. Um, another another one that was interesting was uh, we were asking people to bring classes to this lunch and learn. And what we found is they were only sort of bringing the classes that they were proud of, right? So we'd say, okay, yeah. hey, Carl, Car Carl, it's your turn to bring the code, uh, and he would bring like his his favorite little little piece of code to demo. Um, and so Moses and I wrote a, uh, a script to just sort of run through the code and pick a random class. And we run that three or four times to find something interesting, but maybe it was buried or hidden or, you know, some deep dependency that nobody wanted to look at and nobody wanted to talk about, um, and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to, to really force us to get at, we need a testable code base and we need to yeah. really understand what a shared code base means and, and how do we get to that point and how do we not have you know, eight XML utility classes, right? Uh, which was just sort of obviously a bad anti-pattern, but it was proliferating around the code. Um, the, the, the third thing that we did that was, that was helped with engagement was, um, you know, we would have, you know, about a dozen devs uh, in the launch room working on this code and you still only had, you know, three or four people participating. So we tried a, a variation where we would actually say, okay, every, split into group of you know groups of three or four and everybody take this code and work on it and that actually helped you know there were always a couple of people who were just going to eat lunch and not talk and that sort of got everybody engaged more and so we would all we would all say okay this is the method we're working on we're all going to go split out and work on it and we're going to come back together and we're going to look at each version of that and see what we like from it and figure out which one we want to keep Nice. That's great. Also, oh, it was a group of 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was picturing a smaller group for some reason. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it, was, it was a big dev team. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Right yeah, on. I mean, right and on. The, the goal of it really was to try to get us all to think more about collaborative mm -hmm. work as opposed mm -hmm. to siloed work. And like that, we, we didn't think of it as a, a practice that we were going to do to, to, you know, as, as like necessarily a better way to code in general, but just that we wanted to make the group more collaborative as a whole. I think the goal was really actually to channel us more towards like pair programming and that kind of thing. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, testability. That was our conception at the time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, testability, trying to introduce unit testing into, you know, one and a half, two-year-old code base was a, was a challenge. Yeah. But I think as Andy said, we ran into some interesting things that happen in mobbing when people do it more broadly, which is like, how do you keep everybody in a larger group engaged um, and that kind of stuff. Um, which I'd love to hear from you all and what you've seen. Yeah. There. I, I have a take on that. Um, you know, so I, I don't know if you've ever been to an open space conference, but uh, they have kind of the law of personal mobility, which is like if you're, uh, when you attend a talk, if you're not interested and you're not contributing, then you can go to a different talk. So right. we actually applied that to the mobs. So if you're if you're not learning and you're not contributing, then go to a different mob mm -hmm. um, or start a new one or, you know, whatever. Um, and, uh, and that typically just kind of self-regulates throughout the day. Um, but yeah, and, and kind of, like I said, we, we, we kept mobbing for a very long time. And so, um, we've gone through, you know, we retrospected at the end of, you know, each day for a while and then each week for a while and then each month for a while. So there's, there's been tons of refinement over the years. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it regulates pretty well. And then also, you know, I think there's the opposite piece of it too, where it's like, Hey, we want to go and work by ourselves because this code is not interesting enough. It's like, well, like what makes it not interesting? And, um, one other pa kind of anti-pattern I, I saw was, um, people wanting to go and work by themselves when the problem was so simple that it should have been automated. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, I, I think the flip side of that is when you're going to reduce the size of the mob, um, is the problem actually uh, more simple than the people need to be there? Or is it something that the, the group needs to think about how to automate all that work in the future? So, um, you know, I, I think uh, some good examples of that is like adding a translation library to the entire code base for mm -hmm. languages right so like you, you know you could all split up and write the p you know go into each display page and replace all the text with a translation uh, module or you can write a, a thing that'll go and do that to the code for you and for all of your future projects right right um and so uh you know i so, so those are the two things so don't go so small that you should be automating as a larger group and don't go so big that people are languishing. Um, and if it's a general rule and people self-organize around the work, uh, then that happens very naturally. Um, that makes sense. Hey, Sam, and I've also seen what you all did too, which was uh, <clears throat> split up. Sometimes that, that really works. If you have the mob feels too big, people feel like they have more voice if it's a smaller group or some people won't talk in a group larger than five, right? And so, or they, they're learning to grow in that area. So making it smaller use helps uh, increase uh, the psychological safety for people to share their opinions or, you know, for example, refactoring is great because um, if someone's real proud of a class or someone's, you know, in there, that's much harder to say in a group of 12, like, Hey, I smell something over here, you know, but we're in a smaller <laughs> group. It might be easier to, uh, to surface that. And a couple of more things uh, about that first event before kind of going to today for y'all is I'm just curious because this was, um, you know, pairing was around then, right? So you mentioned driver navigator, um, but obviously uh, there wasn't a lot of like mob patterns or roles or those kind of things going on. So in your, when you were doing the 12 person mob or each of the individual mobs, was it a single driver? Was there any rotation? Uh, what was kind of the flow of, uh, I guess, conversation and uh, code editing, I, I suppose? Yeah. So what I recall is we had, instead of a navigator, we had somebody we called a narrator, which was the person that knew that part of the code already and could kind of speak to how it fit into other things and give us all some context. Cause you know, again, Andy said big code base. Um, and then we went from having one driver to having two drivers at some point is what I feel like I remember again, trying to get more engagement from people. Uh, what do you recall, Andy? Yeah, I, you know, I, we, we didn't, we definitely didn't put an emphasis on rotation, you know, sort of, sort of as is, is popular today. Um, if it was, if it was two people, um, it was just those two people for lunch, you know, they might, they might take turns driving, but it was not, it wasn't, it wasn't so much concerted effort to let everybody touch the keyboard. It was definitely like, you know, also frankly, like 2000s AV, like, you get one person plugged into the into the projector and that that's kind of it <laughs> uh so you know and people were eating lunch so it was it was it was not it was not as dynamic as you'd probably see today with you know there was no there was no notion of time or a clock or or that it was it was you know let's sit down and talk through this code and then like play with it a bit nice nice right on yeah, and we, we still see that too in uh mobbing where people will go uh so to speak freestyle right and i've seen that work really well too is as long as there's good, you know, psychological safety and people are giving each other feedback and there's good equality navigation that can work really well still. And uh, I guess one last question I have before jumping to the next topic is, uh, so you, you did those uh, kind of lunch and learn sessions together. And, um, did you see any side effects from doing it just for a little bit and then going back to how you normally worked? Did it have any negative or positive effects on, uh, on the other work? <laughs> so I left that team and I, and I ended up doing uh, some stuff with the initial India teams that ThoughtWorks had and for a different client. Um, so I can't speak to that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, it, it got, it got more, definitely a, a greater emphasis on code ownership, collective code ownership. Uh, we thought more critically about trying to reuse code versus, you know, sort of copy and paste across modules. It's, it, it, you know, we struggled at times given, you know, huge static methods, you know, in Java, how do you extend something like that? How do you reuse something like that? But we, we moved in that direction. Um, we coupled that with starting to, 
you know, in, in our iteration plannings to, to sign up for stuff outside of sort of outside of your wheelhouse. Um, so it was, it was sort of a concerted effort because we all really wanted to get to be that model XP, you know, extreme programming team. So we were trying both through sort of story assignment or picking up stories and from the side of, of, of mobbing to get, to get more collective. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I mean, and I think, I think that's, <clears throat> It's tough when you're solo because you don't know what you don't know, right? So you may think there is no, I'm not, you know, making a duplication of something, you know, and you've tried a little bit to find it. But I've noticed that quite a bit in mobs is that uh, someone someone will speak up and be like, hey, I noticed you're rewriting this. And like, rewriting what? I'm just writing it. No, no, no. This thing exists over, buried over right. here, right? And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we could reuse that or extend it. And so right. I see that happen a lot more. Uh, with mobbing. And I think, Chris, you can speak into the original mobs. I think a lot of duplication was noticed. And so that apps were starting to be automated because of yeah. like people were together and realizing that, oh, we're kind of doing the same thing with a different, slightly different schema database or whatever. <laughs> you know, yeah. So. Yeah. It was, uh, you know, a lot of the projects, um, you know, we had noticed that there was big similarities to a lot of the projects. And so everybody was working separately. And then, and then when everybody was working together, they're like, oh, let's mob on the thing that I've been responsible for. Okay, let's mob on the thing that you've been responsible for. That's like, wow, like, you know, we could have easily written a generator to make both of these apps from the ground up. Um, and so, you know, we, we uh, it was funny, our, our productivity, you can't even measure our productivity because really, because it was like, everybody was working on their own thing. And then we got together and then delivered you know, uh, a thing. And then we were like, okay, let's keep doing this. And then we made those discoveries. And then it was like, um, the next three or four projects were all kind of similar things to what everybody had been doing uh, already. And so we wrote a generator that, that reverse engineered the database schema, generated all the CRUD operations. And mm -hmm. then, um, essentially we could use a DSL to make any like custom operations afterwards. And so we had finished our next like three or four projects in the time, in less time than it would have taken to do one of them. Um, and then it was like, and then it expanded to all kinds of other um, options. And so, uh, so our, our productivity just went like more than exponential, <laughs> but, but people don't really realize it because you see the people programming, uh, you know, but, but the reality was, is that, um, you know, the, if everybody had stayed siloed, then those projects likely would have been just mm -hmm. onboarded to the team and then somebody would have picked it up and then tinkered away for years. Um, and, uh, and they really didn't need to be. Um, and, uh, and so it, it was, it was fascinating. And so then it just opened up a whole new line of work to the, to the point where we were an internal only team. And then we, we took over all of external product development, uh, as well. Um, and so it was a, yeah, it was, you see all these things that are um, kind of lean waste, you know, duplication mm -hmm. and, um, and defects and all that stuff. It just kind of melts away as you do it. It kind of goes back to that insight that many have had about, you know, coding is not actually building. It's a, it's a design exercise, not a build exercise. Yeah. Um, the computer does the building and yeah. <laughs> programmers design the, you know, provide the specs for the, you know, the building. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of that, you know, you don't, it's not just, a, you know, it's not just laying bricks on a wall. It's, it's a, a process of figuring out how the wall should be constructed and tearing it down and redoing it, you know, 50 times over. Yep. Nice. nice. Cool. Well, this might be a good transition to, uh, so that was back then in the early 2000s. Uh, how's mobbing like for y'all right now? Or recently. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I, I worked on very tiny teams for a long time after ThoughtWorks. Um, and uh, usually with people that weren't as verse and agile as I was. And so uh, my, my feeling has always been to try to have people uh, come up with their own practices as much as possible with some guidance I, I've learned over time. Um, just because you're more invested in retrospectives go better and it's just it's a better way for teams to figure out how they want to work um recently i had i've hired a couple of more experienced very agile experienced folks 
um, from a, a, another consultancy that started here in Chicago, Eighth Flight, that also came out of the, the Agile Crucible. Um, and they brought mobbing into the team. So uh, we've been doing a lot more of it recently to do um, with new team members kind of getting used to the code base and, and learning from each other. And, and uh, we've got a new product that we're rolling out that they've been um, you know, kind of making design decisions about and how, how does it should be different from the other stuff and how should it be the same? And so like all, all that has been super helpful and it's been just really cool to see other people bring that in to, to, to what we're doing. Yeah, for, for us, for ThoughtWorks, um, I think that we've been using it mostly for training. So, you know, sort of college grads, we have a, we have a ThoughtWorks University internal training uh, that we do, and they do a lot of mobbing there. Um, it's for, for us, it's a lot about culture, um, learning, you know, sort of teaching TDD, learning to code collaboratively, uh, and, and sort of slowing down and speaking very intentionally about what you're doing and why you're doing it, you know, as, as, you're, as you're pairing. Um, outside of that, uh, code dojos, you know, if a team decides they want to do lunch and learns and learn go or learn some other, some, some new language, uh, I've used it there, you know, where we go into a conference room and get up on the projector and work through the examples together. Um, we've used it to teach, to teach clients. So a lot of times, uh, there's a, there's a component to our projects of teaching the clients about, about our methods and about agile and, and sort of how to really implement it as, as developers and not just, you know, scrum, scrum waterfall or whatever. <laughs> uh, so we use it there a lot. Um, we've done the, you know, three mobs on the same program problem there um, as part of like a boot camp for their devs though. It, was, it, it really hasn't, I haven't found a lot of examples of it being uh, a core sort of a core practice. Um, I sort of, I wish I could have found that uh, and talked about it, but um, it's been, it's been, it's been very much about learning still and learning culture and learning TDD for us. Um, I, I do have a, I did find out that a friend of mine, uh, Kieran Murphy, who's teaching uh, computer science classes in the evenings. He's a, a, at ThoughtWorks as well. He, he's been teaching his classes as mob programming. Nice. So completely from start to finish. Uh, and, and his, you know, his, his students say they love it because it's really about talking through, okay, how would you, you know, how would a debugger work here and what should we step into and what should we look at um, and, and learning Git and learning things like that. He said that they, they learn these things much faster and get sort of more competent with, with source control and with the notion of software design uh, and sort of understand their thinking and get, get to a place as a team, um, as a, as a class that they can't get individually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, for the for the school classes that I've seen using it, for sure, uh, mm -hmm. there's large leaps in, uh, you know, I think especially in source control too, I've also seen that where it's like, they just never would have used source control <laughs> uh, or they'd email the files back, you know, but one person mm -hmm. in the team would know how to use Git and, you know, just studied it outside or whatever, or the, the professor assigns it. And then like all of a sudden they're kind of all using it. Um, so yeah, I've seen that happen too. Yeah, and, and you know, that's that's a pretty interesting pattern I've seen where um, <clears throat> the adoption rate for uh, mobbing and pairing seems to be higher in a boot camp onboarding mm -hmm. learning type scenario than uh, a doing type scenario. And, uh, you know, um, whether you're designing or, you know, like engineers getting together on a team to to accomplish story A or something like that, right? Um, and so it, that always makes me wonder uh, what what the you know is uh, systemic. You know, is it the people? Is it you know? So there, there's a lot of questions that brew in my mind there. But that's just something I'm, I've been thinking about from a, a bigger perspective. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, for, for us, it, we we do it fairly often now, mm -hmm. and I think it's because. Uh, the team has the right balance of people who are um, at different stages of their career and had different levels of experience with the practice. I think that's mm -hmm. a lot of what it is too. Because I think you know this how you sort of structure a team with different levels of expertise is something I've definitely learned. Like how important that is to creating healthy a healthy team. You know that mm -hmm. really um, fun to work in and productive and, and, and accomplish a lot. So nice. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think um, what's what's awesome from what both of you have shared is that uh, it appears the teams have ownership, right? It's uh, no one's forcing them to do it. And uh, when they do it, if they want to, and then that's great. And it's because they've experimented with it and found value and that, that that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, right. 
yeah um so cool um yeah anything else on your current mobbing before uh you know jumping into team building and mobbing or any questions you had for us <laughs> not really um i guess I'd, I'd love to hear I, I think i think that um sorry moses let me cut you off you you've done you know you've done mobbing as a as a sort of a first class first class concern um i would love to hear more about that uh i to me that i hate to say i i had almost never thought of it outside of a outside of a learning and sharing sort of context so sure. you know yeah. to some extent how is it you know how is it different yeah. Uh, well, so we've been doing uh, full-time mobbing for the last 10 years. Um, and uh, so it started with one team for about four years. Um, that team uh, got to the point where um, we were releasing twice a day to production uh, with zero bugs reported from production for a year and a half. Um, so, so there was kind of... Uh, at, after that four years, there's kind of an external third party auditor that kind of came in and um, and they kind of evaluated software practices across all the different teams at the company and just said, you know, you need to really grow this to, to every other aspect of software you're doing. So then we formed a department um, and, and we started kind of gradually growing. Uh, and uh, there's a there's a paper out there called Growing the Mob. Uh, um, for, for the big agile, uh, alliance, uh, proceedings. And, um, they just talk about, you know, kind of scaling up that team from five people to 30 and, uh, and then kind of using a, a kind of cellular biology grow and split, you know, method where you just kind of add people to the mob until people are, you know, less interested and then you split and then you add people until they split again. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'd say as far as differences go, um, you know, I, I think just all the, all the benefits that you get from pairing, you know, you kind of increase this. I think Austin had told me this a, a little while ago, the benefits that you get from pairing just go up even more as you add people. Um, and there, you know, there's a ceiling of complexity there, kind of like what I was talking about as well, where it's like, um, you know, you lose engagement. The largest mob I've ever been in was like 20 people that was at a conference working on a, um, you know, like a, a beta key for a quantum computer because everybody was <laughs> chiming in, right? It was like very engaged, active. Everybody had ideas of what to try and, and thoughts on it. Um, and then, you know, um, kind of all the way down. Uh, and, but like the difference between two and three, I think is really important. Um, so, uh, when you're just two and somebody leaves to take a break, like things can't continue on, right? Um, without like some like catch up and, and things like that. Um, and then also the social dynamic is very different. Um, I think in a pair, you always kind of, um, it's, it's very common to establish like a, you know, this person is teaching that person, right? There's like a, a leadership dynamic that forms in pairs that just doesn't exist in a trio. It's, it's more of like everybody's kind of bouncing ideas off of each other. It becomes more of a dialogue than, um, than kind of, uh, you know, almost like a more one-sided thing, um, especially if you're doing kind of like a senior and a junior or something like that, where it's like really obvious. Um, and then uh, I also think that the, um, uh, yeah, so, so maybe those, those, those are kind of the main points. Um, Austin, do you have any that come on? Sure, I'm actually interested to hear Moses first, if you don't mind, Moses. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, a large period of time separated my two experiences. <laughs> uh, so, and the very different teams. Uh, uh, so like, like, I get like, like uh, Andy mentioned, the ThoughtWorks team is 12 developers. Ours is four developers plus me on the side. Um, and I, I think that... Uh, I would agree with, with what you said, Chris. Like, I think that um, it changes the social dynamics in a really nice way where people at any level of experience can just kind of, you know, like there's a, there's a thing in junior senior pairing, so to speak, where um, uh, people talk about where it's, you know, people think that the senior is teaching the junior, but a lot of times the junior asks lots of really good questions that makes the senior actually think about what they're doing. <laughs> and so he or she can like make better decisions as well. Um, but I think it goes beyond that because sometimes um, 
you know, just I've seen roles where people take on, you know, uh, holding the team accountable to like this making enough sense in a certain way, you know? <laughs> kind of bringing us back to that. Um, and, and, and so I totally agree that it changes those dynamics where it's no longer so much of a um, mentor mentee type of, of interaction. Uh, but yeah, I, I think, you know, um, we'll see how it evolves. We've been doing it for like a, a few months now, two or three months uh, with these new people joining. And um, it's, and everybody loves it. Like I, the team keeps telling me like in our one-on-ones, like how much they enjoy the teamwork and all that kind of stuff. So um, we'll Ooh. see where it goes. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess for me, one thing I've been reflecting on lately is I've kind of known this about myself, uh, my life uh, for a while was uh, if I'm a computer, I'm always just one window open. Like uh-huh. <laughs> there's no multi-threading going on for me. Uh, or if I do, I'm very terrible at it. Um, and so what I love about mobbing is that um, it allows, <clears throat> I think it allows multiple people to kind of have that mode and each coming at it from a different angle. So if you're in a mob and you're learning, you're focusing on what you're learning. You don't mm-hmm. have to be stressed out or concerned or worried about necessarily delivering at that moment because the mob can help carry that, you know? And we, we tell people who are coming in and are, that are less experienced, like, it's great. Your focus is learning and that's okay. You know what I mean? And then um, once you're kind of, you feel you're at an adequate level to contribute, your focus can be on contributing, right? And then once you're, and so you, your single focus can be that. And then uh, <clears throat> once you've kind of gotten maybe past those two levels in a code base or with a team or something like that, then you can start focusing on meta things like, oh, how are people interacting? How can I, you know, make nudges or suggestions to help people interact better? How are we interacting with our customers and stakeholders? How can I nudge it in that direction? You know, so they're working on, you know, code piece A, and I'm seeing them make two or three assumptions that we don't know are true about the domain. Maybe I should interrupt and ask a question to lead us to talk to someone or, um, you know, and so what, what I've seen, what's really cool is um, <clears throat> if everyone in a mob is kind of doing their different piece, um, all those things happen instead of, you know, uh, resyncing later. So everything, uh, I love a saying, uh, I can't remember his name from LinkedIn. Um, I'll have to look it up, but he said, everything done async has a resync, right? And so whether it's refactoring, whether it's learning, whether it's contribution, whether it's, um, you know, the code being implemented is out of line with customer's expectations or we're taking a huge horizontal slice, you know, so everything done uh, async will need to be resynced later anyways. And I feel with mobbing, a lot of those things will happen the more and more expertise you have in the mob, it'll just happen there and it's done and the quality is built right. in. Um, right. Yeah. Cool. But um, that, that's just my experience is, as we like to say, uh, uh, we're just sharing and not recommending. And, uh, you know, every, every team and dynamics is very different. You'll have different results of experiments, but um, cool. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. Anything else you guys wanted to share on team building with mobbing in your experiences? Uh, that's kind of the final topic for today. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say it, you know, it, it did our original experiment with it really did um, help break down those barriers between the team. You know, it took time. Um, People had built sort of their areas of expertise, you know, so-and-so was the, was the credit scoring person. And -and so-and-so was the, you know, finance, financial engine person. uh, And breaking that down did take, did take time and it took dedication and sort of very intentional, um, actions across the board you know we must make sure that you know andy gets to sign up uh for this this credit thing uh, this credit story and and andy's going to be the lead for this credit story because we need we can't just have carl do it right if 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 carl's in charge of it then you know I, i'll sit there with him but i won't really learn but if i say i am i am the primary on this card uh then you know it, it will help bring break that down so it was it was a good step for us to see you know where the silos were, where the knowledge was, where the, you know, the weird, the sort of dusty, dark corners of the code, where there was some really bad, you know, redundancy in there. Um, it was very effective at, at, at all that. Um, and it got us eventually to where everybody kind of knew everything. And we had some specialties for, you know, very specific parts of the code, but generally we ended up in a very collaborative team uh, and, and very, very clear collective code ownership. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's, it's, cool how that practice that we just sort of, you know, really dabbled with for a while for that very specific purpose way back in, you know, 2001, Mm -hmm. I think it largely stayed dormant for like a decade until 
there's a few people using, I mean, it's a practice that's been used since the beginning of time. I'm sure programmers yeah. getting around keyboards is, is not <laughs> a thing. Um, but uh, then when, when you know, uh, Woody and, and folks really started to promote it and like make it a, a, a thing that was talked about a lot, I think he, he did the, the discipline and great service to, to really deepen our appreciation for how deep collaboration can go and how impactful it can be on a team. Um, so uh, it's, it's just cool. It's, it's fun. It was fun to kind of see it have a life beyond the, the lunch and learn experiences that, that were helpful to us. But like we, we were not promoting it a lot ourselves. We, we did the, the talk, but then we kind of let, let it be after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I, I saw such a huge benefit to it that like I, I went from, you know, conference to conference talking about it, you know, what he did as well. And, you know, we just, we really wanted to grow, grow that um, because I, I, at previous jobs, I had really seen a lot of dysfunction. And then I, you know, in this, in this really great experience, we had um, a lot of that uh, um, dysfunction just kind of evaporated away. And then mm -hmm. we just became really, really effective. And, uh, and, you know, is coming out of that experience. It was like, yeah, we should just talk about it all the time. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, it, yeah. It actually, you just made me think of something, Chris, which mm -hmm. is that um, I wonder, you spoke about the social dynamics. I also yeah. wonder about, you know, on, on large developer teams, and I think this was somewhat the case on that team I just mentioned, there was personal stuff between some of the people, you know? Yep. Uh, <clears throat> and the more you work with other people, you know, you get to know them as people and it's like you have more of a collegial relationship and that just creates a, a different feeling um for the for the team dynamics i would imagine yeah. Yeah. It, are those the types of dysfunctions you're mentioning as well or yeah yeah uh interpersonal stuff um yeah it, it's you know probably in a mob interpersonal stuff is either uh either goes away completely or is amplified but but because you know if it's amplified then you can talk about it you can dig into it Right. Um, but I, I see like in solo development, for sure, it's like people can hate each other for years and years and years and years <laughs> and uh, and they can avoid each other enough, but sabotage each other here and there to the point where, uh, you know, the, the company ends up spending a lot of money on that dysfunction um, and mobbing. It comes to a head very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and and so you get into, you know, feedback cycles and other things along those lines. Um, right. And uh, yeah, so for sure, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I, whenever we interview, I've in, as I've interviewed developers over the years, I always do a pair programming session with them, which is now pretty common. But what's wonderful about that is it's so immediate. Like for one time, there was one time when I had a developer, she just stood up and said, you know what? I'm not into TDD. I'm not, this is done. <laughs> and, and I don't think it would have come to a head if we had not been pairing and I'm not sort of prompting her a little bit, you know, why don't we try writing the test first and that kind of thing. And just, you know, it, it, it fleshes things out. And that was a great result of that interview because she would have been miserable <laughs> yeah. working with us. So, um, so anyway, yeah, I, I think uh, it's, it's that personal interaction and collaboration is just so it's, it's so important. So, yeah. Yeah. And I'll just say that there are, uh, you know, there are companies that are less extreme and more extreme in the practice as well. And so uh, like even more extreme than us, you know, I know a company that does, you know, mob HR and mob finance and uh, their entire companies, everything on their company uh, is visible on our lease train and all this other stuff, like very, very interesting, um, mm. you know, all the way to just, uh, you know, learning sessions. Right. Um, and so, uh, but I, I think, all in all, the practice in general just provides a different style. So, and I, and I really like what you said, Moses, about uh, there's really probably nothing new about a group of people getting around one thing to work on it, or you said like a keyboard, or and I, and I love that there, you know, that there's really probably nothing new under the sun uh, with a lot of this stuff. It's a lot of rediscovering, right. like uh, right. of uh, great things from the past. And actually, me and a coworker did kind of it was partially joking talk on like classic agile and mobbing, like finding all these ancient quotes of people working <laughs> together, you know, instead of, right. up. but, right. you know, and you think about it because uh, so many things lend itself to working together, literally side by side. I remember someone wrote a, a LinkedIn post saying like, imagine a movie where no one worked together and literally everything was done asynchronous code review, but like person right. A records by themselves mm -hmm. and the person B records by themselves. And then everything <laughs> is edited and 
you know, right. merged together, so to speak, back in. Oh, right? I, you know, actually, there there is a case of that. So, um, oh, I know, but <laughs> arrest, like, there's a really yeah. great one. Arrested Development. Actually, the first two seasons mm -hmm. were recorded with everybody together, and the third season, no one could schedule together, so they actually recorded separately and like <laughs> stitched everything together. Yeah, and the quality went went considerably down. Uh. <laughs> and so if I, you know, um, maybe, maybe I'll get a bunch of, uh, if, if you actually like the third season of Rested Development, please let us know in the comments. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, um, it was a kind of an exact case like that. They just couldn't get that, that synergy that they had when they were working together. And I think that exists in software development as well. So that's a great point. Um, okay. So, uh, we There's are one more uh, thing I was going to say, Austin, yeah. just sorry to interrupt you. Go, go ahead. Um, is completely agree i think there's something really um fundamental to what you just said uh coming from sort of a, a innovative innovation perspective being you know working in a startup for a while trying to figure out how to make something new in the world a lot of people's conception of innovation is you have this amazing idea and then the world changes that does sometimes happen to some extent but i think much more common is you have an idea and then you have to make it live. You have to get it out into the world. You have to get people engaging with it. You have to figure out how they engage with it and what, what makes it meaningful to them. And so like all the, all the thoughts that have come into our space around user research and, and human centered design and, and lean startup, like that have taught us to be responsive to the world as we innovate. I think that's, that's what, uh, you know, Chris and, and Woody did with this practice is that they really went deep into it and they really engaged the world with it. And that's why it's so popular today. So I think um, that I think that lesson is just really important for everybody to learn. And we've definitely encountered it trying to change healthcare for the better is, is how important um, that that kind of sensitivity to the world and, and the need to make the innovation something that people really engage with um, to make it successful. Awesome. All right, uh, we are about at time. And so I wanted to ask you guys if you had anything to plug or share before we closed out the show. Andy? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, ThoughtWorks is is hiring. Um, I've, I've worked there, as I said, a long time, two decades. Uh, I love it. And uh, I encourage anybody, you know, to, to take a look at it um, and come enjoy, enjoy fixing hard problems with me. Awesome. We are not currently hiring for developers at Flare Health, but we are hiring uh, a lead user researcher. And I'm sure we'll be hiring developers later this year. So please reach out to us at Flare Health, which is F L A R E Health. All right. And uh, thank you both so much for this opportunity. It was really fun. Yeah, it's been awesome. Absolutely. Thank really you. Really awesome. Um, and uh, to our audience, um, if you uh, maybe know somebody who wants to know maybe the differences between uh, mobbing and pairing and otherwise, or uh, maybe could see the different contexts uh, that you could use mobbing in, then please share this episode with them. Uh, and, uh, you know, with that, please like, subscribe, uh, share your comments, and we will see you next time. Thank you and bye-bye.